All right, so um, today uh, I'm going to talk about the why of sensory care. Why does this type of care matter in our care homes for older people? Understanding the why helps us better navigate the how and it provides the motivation for us to act. This is the, the, the why is embedded in a human rights based approach for everyone involved. So the right to information, the right to communication, the right to language. We'll define sensory care as any type of care related to the senses, which is necessary for a person's communication, access to information and mobility. These are the three key themes of the Scottish Sensory Hub. These themes are human rights as well as being critical enablers to accessing other rights. My slide here has a large picture of the brain and a quote from the neuroscientist David Eagleman on it. It says, the way your brain perceives the world is informed by your senses. When we talk about the senses in terms of communication, we might automatically think about eyes or ears or skin for tactile communication. But in fact, your eyes, ears and skin don't directly hear or see or feel any of the world around you. This all happens in your brain. Our eyes, ears and skin are responsible for converting information into neural signals or what we call sparks in the dark. And these stream into your brain and then the brain very cleverly assigns meaning to them. So the picture show of your life is dependent on the incoming information from the outside world. When we get older, we experience cognitive aging and that affects our processes for knowing, learning and understanding. But we're also susceptible to age related sensory changes and the two are inextricably linked and um, they're, they're all part of the same network. I think it's hugely important we start talking about our senses as integral to our brain health. Sensory care is about brain health in the same way that dementia care is about brain health. And this is particularly significant when we consider dual sensory loss of both sight and hearing, when one sense no longer compensates for the other. Though it's not the only symptom, cognitive decline is often associated with memory problems. And to illustrate the link between our senses and memory, we can refer to what we would call the cognitive information processing model. So on the screen, we have a horizontal flow chart and it starts with sensory perceptual memory. And this is the information we take in from our environment through our senses, such as sight, sound and touch. We want to note here that it's at the very beginning of our memory process. So sensory information then feeds into working memory and under the correct conditions, this would feed into long-term memory. Working memory is the brain's ability to hold on to your sensory input and make effective use of it, even though the sensory event itself has passed. So a great example of working memory in action today is the work of our electronic note takers and our BSL English interpreters. They are taking in the information from my speech and they're holding on to it long enough to turn it into a sign, a spoken word or a written word. If their senses don't pick up this information clearly, this makes their job much harder. Similarly, we can think of how audio description and touch feeds into um, the, se the sensory perceptual memory for those with sight loss. So in short, if we want to remember something, well, this is dependent on the accessibility of the information received from our senses. My next slide is entitled The Nun Study, and it has a picture of MRI brain scans on it. This study followed the lives of 678 women aged 75 to 102 years when the study started. Um, the nuns were chosen because they had standardised routines of daily living, so similar social interactions, similar physical activities. And each year the women would undergo physical and cognitive assessments. 
amazingly, each participant consented to don um, donate their brain after death for analysis. And remarkably, from the participants where Alzheimer's disease was evident in the brain at autopsy, um, just over a third showed no symptoms of cognitive decline when they were living. The researchers explained this by the nuns' non-sedentary lifestyles in the older years, which enabled the brain to continue to make new pathways, despite existing connections disintegrating from the disease. So the brain never stops being able to make new connections as we age. And what's really important is that brains are most stimulated when they're communicating with other human beings. It's one of the best things you can do. The benefits of human connection are well documented. The researcher Susan Pinker reported on what characteristics help us live well for the longest. Um, it was definitely a surprise to me that the top factors for staying alive were not related to diet, exercise, alcohol intake, or even smoking, but at the top were close relationships and social integration. Pinker said face-to-face -face contact releases a whole cascade of neurotransmitters and like a vaccine, they protect you now in the present and well into the future. It's hugely powerful to think of person-to-person -person interaction as a vaccine to promote longevity and well-being. This is linked to something called co-regulation, where interactions from one person can help soothe a state of stress or distress in another person. So if sensory input to the brain and social integration are key for our wellness, what's the impact on our brain when we might be deprived of these? So this is exactly what happened to prisoners in Alcatraz who were confined, confined to an isolation cell, which they called the hole. Um, a prisoner called Robert Luke was there for about a month and he described how the conditions of no light, no sound and no human interaction invoked intense auditory and visual hallucinations because his brain was trying to keep his sensory and, and cognitive areas active to prevent these networks from disintegrating. And other prisoners have described similar experiences. We might call this the Alcatraz effect to help us think about what may be happening to at least some degree in the brains of care home residents whose sensory needs are not met or identified. We know that in dementia with Lewy bodies, for example, both visual and auditory hallucinations can present. And the literature states that identifying the causes, uh, any cause of, of sensory deprivation is key to alleviating these experiences. There's also been cases where treatment of age-related eye conditions such as cataracts have remedied visual hallucinations. So I'm not suggesting that care homes are like prisons enforcing conditions of sensory deprivation but it's more to spark our interest in how sensory deprivation can affect our care home residents' brains and how they might communicate to this, uh, this to us, maybe through distressed behaviour. If we move on to care homes, how do we get to the care homes that we have today? So the first legislation came in in 1845 through the Poor Law Scotland Act. And that said, um, a person could apply for indoor relief if they'd exhausted all other options. Interestingly, a poor house was defined as a facility or establishment in which people, such as the sick or needy, live and receive care typically in a confined setting and often without individual consent. Access to a poor house was predicated on a position of poverty um, not age. And in fact, age didn't come in the into the legislation until 1948 in the form of the National Assistance Act. Um, and that was the same year the NHS was formed um, and the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights was published in 2013. Up to that point, um, the report said that Scotland had a good record in policy and lawmaking, but human rights were not consistently being protected um, in people's everyday lives. And some of the key areas of concern included um, care rights, 
um, health and, and social care. So since 1845, we've transitioned from poor houses to a very different picture of care homes for older people in Scotland. We've got the Care Inspectorate, the, social the Scottish Social Services Council, Public Health Scotland, Health and Social Care Standards, the See Here Strategy, the BSL Scotland Act, the Deaf Dementia Experience Toolkit, and very recently, which you may all have seen, uh, was the publication of the Scottish Government's new Dementia Strategy. And all this should be celebrated because it represents a huge amount of progress. You might sense a butt coming. So sensory care in our care homes is unfortunately not in a good state. But it's really important to add here that this is also the global picture. This is not just Scotland. The consistent findings are that sensory needs are largely unidentified and when they are identified, they're poorly supported. So this means the Alcatraz effect may be or is at work and we don't even realise it. To make it worse, we can explain behaviours or symptoms resulting from sensory deprivation to cognitive decline. Uh, to, to cognitive decline or dementia because these can be the same. We don't realise how not meeting sensory needs is preventing social integration and human connection or how it might be exacerbating cognitive decline. So I could talk about a lot of things at this point, but I'm going to focus in on care home data to help us understand the scale of what we might be missing. Recommendation five of the current See Here strategy is about data collection. So it says there should be robust systems for maintaining information locally and sharing these among agencies. It says reliable information is basic to understanding prevalence as well as identifying gaps and opportunities for service improvement. In our care homes, Public Health Scotland publish the Scottish Care Home Census every year. It's not mandatory, but um, most, most care homes do it. It does ask about sensory needs, which is positive. But the guidance for care home managers to complete this data section, I think, needs urgent attention. So it defines hearing impairment as anyone with profound or partial deafness or other difficulties in hearing. If the hearing problem can be resolved by the use of a hearing aid, then the person should not be listed as having a hearing impairment. And with, vi with vision impairment, anyone who is blind or partially sighted, if the sight problem can be resolved by wearing glasses or contact lenses, then the person should not be listed as having a visual impairment. So firstly, the guidance doesn't differentiate across the spectrum of sight loss or deafness. How is data collected for BSL users or people with deaf blindness, for instance? We don't currently have a definition of deaf blindness, though work is currently being undertaken on this topic. Um, and there's a report on the prevalence rates for those with dual sensory loss and dementia in Scotland, which was published just last year. We can note that the language used in Scottish, Scotland's national census um, was vastly different from what was used for um, the care home census. And it's unclear why the two don't align. You might remember when you were filling out um, the, the national census what the, the language was like there. Secondly, why is the reference to hearing aids, glasses and contact lenses required? Um, as part of my research, I asked Public Health Scotland this, and they said that they weren't trying to account for every sensory loss that had no bearing on social care needs. I'm curious as to what sensory needs exist that do not have a, a bearing on a person's um, social care needs. To illustrate the limitations of the care home sensory data, I've made a graph of their data compared with the evidence-based research figures for prevalence of deafness and sight loss in care homes for older people. The graph on the left shows the census data where the prevalence of dementia 
was reported at 64%. Sight loss was reported at only 13% and deafness at just 8%. So there's about 30,000 um, care home residents in, in, in Scotland and we think that only 13% have sight loss and 8% have um, any level of deafness. The graph on the um, the graph on the right has been corrected based on what we know from peer-reviewed evidence, and it shows sight loss at 64% and deafness at 91%. So sight loss is as prevalent as dementia, and deafness has an almost 30% higher prevalence than dementia. And this must mean that dual sensory loss must also be highly prevalent. So I think you'll agree that the difference there is quite stark. The Care Home Census suggests that we're looking for a needle in a haystack when we're trying to identify people with sensory needs, when in fact we're looking for a piece of hay in a giant stack full of hay. And this may be part of the reason sensory needs go unidentified or are poorly supported. Our national care home data set vastly underestimates the level of sensory needs, and this has an impact on service planning and allocated resources. A question to consider here is, are we managing healthy ageing or are we actively speeding up deterioration inadvertently? When we look at uh, academic recommendations for improving sensory care in care homes, a common one is screening. Um, the World Health Organization states that the purpose of screening is to identify people in an apparently healthy population who are at risk of a health problem or a condition so that an early treatment or intervention can be offered. My personal belief is that when prevalence rates are as high as 64% and 91%, screening is not an efficient use of resources for the care home population. Small example from my own research, I asked care home residents a series of 10 questions about their listening experiences in different situations um, from a validated screening questionnaire. And six of the residents said that their hearing was fine. When I checked their hearing, they all had at least some degree of hearing loss. And um, at, at the top of the chart here, um, there was one lady who was registered blind and she thought her hearing was fine, but that her sight was getting worse. In an ageing population, if your screening tool doesn't show any degree of sensory loss, I think we have to consider how effective the screen is. Remember the statistics say 64% and 91%. Hugely important here is that sensory assessments are not a means to an end where the end is a hearing aid, glasses or similar. That's definitely not, not the point. Sensory assessments are an end in themselves. Um, to inform person-centered care so that the person can decide for themselves what they need to enable optimum communication, accessible information and mobility. So this brings us on to the limitations of cognitive assessments, um, especially when, when sensory needs are not accounted for. Sensory assessments are performed in conjunction with cognitive assessments in some parts of Wales. Yet in Scotland, I'm not aware of this joined up approach and I find that really worrying. So research has shown that when we simulate even a mild hearing loss on cognitively healthy adults, the result of the cognitive assessments falsely indicate a diagnosis of dementia. When cognitive assessments validated on spoken language are used for BSL users, the results are not valid because these rely on BSL interpreting in written English and that impacts on the test validity. So fortunately, there's now the British Sign Language Cognitive Screening Test, which doesn't require an interpreter or written English responses. <clears throat> 
This is used in the first cognitive dementia assessment clinic in the UK for the deaf community. Um, more work needs to be done on cognitive assessments for people with dual sensory loss, deaf blindness. Another recommendation which recurs in the literature on care homes is staff training. And I know that this is a this is a big topic that we've heard from across the um, across the sea here leads. Many research approaches involve investigating staff knowledge of different aspects of sensory awareness and sensory care. And inevitably, the conclusions are that staff don't know enough, and that's to the detriment of care home residents. But this has been the pattern for at least 70 years. Um, where the research says to improve the status quo, we need better staff training. Well, we do need better staff training, but we also need to be cognizant of all the issues of human rights and social justice affecting not just our care home residents, such as ageism, disability, um, deafness. We also need to be aware of the human rights um, factors affecting the social care workforce. The recent independent review of adult social care identified workers are at risk of negative stereotypes, challenging working conditions and gender inequalities because the workforce is, um, is, is mostly female. It's important not to act from a position of blame over the status quo but from curiosity and innovation to bring forward new solutions which supports everyone's human rights. As we said, this is not just a Scottish issue, this is, this is a global issue. So there's a lot more ground to cover about this hugely important topic, and I'm sure every one of us could give at least one case study or example of poor sensory care in the care home population. But what's positive is that there's huge scope for improvement and even relatively small changes would make a huge difference if we're aware of the scale of the problems. Remember, it's the whole haystack we're talking about. It's not just a piece of hay. So I'll leave you with this quote on the importance of our senses for brain health and human connection before we go to our panel and start some discussion. Like a tree that needs nutrient rich soil to arborize, a brain requires the rich soil of social and sensory interaction. <laughs>